morning to all the dignitaries present on the dais and all my fellow companions i mahima chabra student manager of shri balaji society feeling privileged to introduce to you all the renowned personality mr rajesh kurup managing director of north milwood brown india rajesh sir has experience of 24 years across market research industry his expertise areas are brand guidance system advertising and communication research b2b and consumer research on technology csat market sizing and forecasting currently he leads the north region for milwood brown in india he is actively engaged in brand and communication research for leading technology automotive airline durables and cpc brands apart from fmcg now i request rajesh sir to come and share his experience welcome sir so today the topic that was kept for me was quite broad in terms of talking to you guys about how things have been with me all through uh, and i did hear a few uh, few sound bites which i found very interesting today morning one of them being the vuca world i think someone there mentioned that uh, and and how do we manage in in vuca world uh, we'll touch upon these uh, uh, but before that i thought Uh, maybe i must just introduce uh, the field of market research to you uh, in in a different way uh, so i will attempt to do that by the help of a pr presentation that uh, that i found it in interesting it's not created by me and i will tell you about who created it but it is an interesting presentation to um, understand market research a bit differently so let's understand a bit of about what i do and before uh, we clearly understand that let's start from the very beginning imagine yourself sitting inside and driving into this place can you imagine yeah how does that feel good yeah okay imagine yourself being served with the spread of this nature how does that feel great want to stay in this house yeah what if you were here instead of this auditorium good what if this was your cushion for the kon banega karodpati final event how would you feel lucky so we come back to the question what exactly is marketing about and that's what we're going to talk right people ask is it about running campaigns to educate people on how to protect yourself against measles or is it running campaigns to ensure that you clean up the place where you stay and your surroundings is it about creating societies that can be sustainable that can be uh, better looked after from a larger economic management perspective so can we define marketing i'll give you some key keywords i've given you two two three different scenarios two three different situations and i'll give you some keywords need understand create desire want value satisfy profitability can can we piece this together to imagine and understand what would marketing be about can we right now we will move to a different subject economics in the same way can you define what is economics using scarce resources optimally to fulfill human needs right right what is psychology to understand why we behave the way we do and thereby be able to appreciate each other and create much more happy coexistence right what is religion 
hot topic of today. Right? It is an antithesis of marketing. So if you see all those definitions and discussion points that we have touched upon in the previous slides, talk about maximizing happiness by fulfilling desires. Okay. But when we get introduced to religion, we again maximize happiness, not by fulfilling desires, but by reducing the desires, right? So it's in a way antithesis to marketing. Of course, it also uh, aims to prescribe, uh, prescribe the ethics and the norms for harmonious coexistence in the society. So again, we come back to our problem after dabbling in different, different subjects. What is the truth about marketing? So marketing perhaps is about trying to fulfill happiness by ensuring that the desires that you have are fulfilled more suitably, more better. And we also have understood that religion is an antithesis of marketing, right? So in many ways, both marketing and religion need to coexist. You need to have desires, you need to change desires. You need to have fulfillment of desires, and you need to have desires that can be fulfilled, right? But why are we dabbling in so many different subjects to understand marketing? And the truth is that marketing is a relatively new subject. It needs wholesome pursuit. We still wonder whether it's a science or an art. And before we try to make an opinion, let's look at some of the things and decipher for ourselves whether these were science or art. Would you call this science or art? Do you call this science or art? Both? Okay. Let's move on. Is this science or art? Okay. There are mixed opinions here. Is this a science or an art? And this? And this? You saw this in the beginning, right? And this? And this? So, is it a science or an art? Now we come back to advertisements. Science or an art? Is this a science or an art? Is this a science or an art? And thus, you see, at the subliminal best, any human endeavor has to be an art. But, so is the case, I wouldn't say but, but so is the case with marketing. It's not about big jobs. It's not about fancy titles. It's not about hefty paychecks. It's not about jargons. It's not about any of these, but it's simply creating value to people in life in the best way we can. And that's exactly what the Googles, Facebook, the, uh, the names that you saw today, the SoftBanks and others have done. They created value to people's life in the best way they could. And in order to do that, in order to reach that pursuit, reach that goal, you need market research. So market research is the brain behind the marketing. Without the MR head, that is the market research head, the body of marketing can rarely exist. Right? So it's an art, for sure. But to get to the perfection that an artist needs to get, you'll have to make it a lifetime pursuit. If you don't pursue in that significant manner, the perfection would not set in. So don't for a moment think that we know everything or we find our subjects boring. They are not. And reading a chapter or two will not tell us everything about it. Remember, even those who wrote the chapter and authored the books are still learning, are still trying to pursue the pursuit of truth. Right? So if you are good, Definitely, market research can help you own that Ferrari which you saw, right? But I can tell you one thing. When you get it, your mind state will not, not be the same as what it is today when you look at it, 
right? There will be a difference. And that's what our life would be about. So that's how I would put market research as. It's a young science. It, it borrows from politics, economics, psychology, sociology, anthropology, statistics. It borrows from marketing. It borrows from consumer behavior. And it tries to understand consumers in a manner that marketers can be enabled and empowered to create better value for them. And having said that, I would um, now tell you about a bit more about what we need to do to enable the entire marketing fraternity to deliver that value. At the base of it, of course, you have your subjects. You have your conceptual understanding done. When you learn these subjects, it's important to learn it not from a perspective of passing the exam, but from appreciating the nuances of the subject and thereby being able to apply those nuances to problems, right? It is when you do that, you, you evolve your mind not to solve that particular problem, but you evolve your mind to create the capability to solve problems. And that's what you need when you are into a VUCA world. So VUCA is about volatility, it's about uncertainty, it's about complexities, it's about ambiguities, right? And, and there is all of these in our lives, in the lives of the companies, in the lives of the marketing managers, in the life of brand managers, in the life of everybody out there. If you develop the skills that you have to address the VUCA, for example, volatility. How do you address volatility? By bringing stability, right? You have to go to the opposite of volatility and bring stability. There are things that will help you to stabilize, but not unless you are micro-focused on knowing what's causing that volatility, right? To understand what causes the volatility, to understand what, need, what causes that volatility, you will need to, again, be focused on decoding or decomposing the volatile problem into small, small components and understand interrelationships of these components to the larger confusion and the chaos it is creating, right? What is the art or the science that enables you to decompose volatility into smaller components and study them independently? Market research attempts to do that. But market research is just a congregation of many different fields. So therefore, what will enable you to do that? It is an open-mindedness to appreciate and absorb the learnings from different, different fields and apply it to the business problems of day-to-day -day life, right? If you take up the next part of VUCA, which is uncertainty, you're going to be faced with uncertainty, and uncertainty is a reality. There's nothing as certain as uncertainty, right? Right? Is there anything more certain than uncertainty? No. So we will be faced with uncertainty. How can you make, how can you battle uncertainty? You can battle it only by bringing in certainty, right? And what, what will enable you to do that? To enable that, you need to understand the characteristics of the uncertainty. What causes uncertainty? The key elements that make things non-predictable. Okay. Sometimes people have gone to the extent of saying, that is so uncertain, so let me create the future. Predicting future is so uncertain that let me just create it so that I don't have to predict it. So I know that I'm creating the future and I know what the future is about, right? So dealing with uncertainty requires you to, de to, to create competencies that allow you to bring certainty. If you talk about complexity, the next and the third element of the VUCA, Complex things are something human minds hate. We don't like to, like to make things complex, but we end up making them complex, right? We all like simple, simple things. If there's a simplicity in the design, it gets easily adopted by the consumers, right? You create a complex product, people are not going to take it. You create a complex piece of communication, people are not going to sit and listen to it, right? They want simple, simple explanations, simple stuff. But invariably, we end up creating complexities. 
Now, the big question is, how do we deal with complexities? By simplifying them, right? So that's where we will have to keep challenging ourselves to ensure how do we present the complex ideas in a simplistic manner? How do we um, look at our things so as to simplify? As MBA graduates, when you go back, I'm sure at your homes, people will be asking you, what did you study? Or what do you do, right? What did you do in the college? What do you tell them? Any typical answer that you can hear? How many of you have tried to explain to your grandmothers and grandfathers what you do in an MBA college? Have you bothered to explain, not explain? Yeah? And when you have explained what you do as an MBA student in a college to your grandmother and grandfather, were they able to understand you? No? Right. Attempt doing that. That is the first attempt you will make to simplify things. And in fact, one of my colleagues tell me that if his PhD thesis he's not able to explain to his grandmother, then he hasn't done a PhD. Right? He puts it that way. He challenges himself to simplify his entire thesis in a manner that his grandmother can understand that. So it's about practicing that. That's how you bring simplicity to complex situations. You learn the art and science of doing that by trying to talk to people whom you think cannot connect with you, cannot connect with your ideas because they have not evolved to think in a complex way. Talk to them, try to tell them a complex idea in a simple way test and understand whether they understood you or not. Remember, it's not their test, it's your test. You're trying to test your capability to simplify things. And that's an important skill to need it in the VUCA world. And the last one is about ambiguity. The last of the VUCA terminologies deal with ambiguity. And to deal with ambiguity, you have to just make yourself unambiguous, specific. And that begins with the way we speak, the way we talk, right? And it's simple to think of, to start off with. But once you do those simple steps well, then you realize that there are too many ambiguities that need to be re re removed. And therefore, to be specific, to be unambiguous in what you say, becomes even more important. And people like to hear unambiguous statements. Imagine you buying a, a complex, uh, you buying a loan, right? So complex, you have a 20-page document to sign. Do you even read it? No, you just sign it, right? You just look at the face of the salesman and say, okay, I can trust this guy, I can trust this bank, I just buy it, right? You don't go through all the terms and conditions, right? Now, that's because it's complex. It's, it's ambiguous at times to you and you're just trusting that something will happen and you will never need to deal with those specific clauses. Right? But if you develop this capability of being specific, you will be able to spot them faster, spot them quicker. Right? So having said that, where does all that lead us to? All the skills and capabilities need to be applied to the science of solving marketing problems. And when we do that, we can throw up some realization. So what I'm now going to do is to show to you a very recent um, uh, presentation that was done by Milward Brown. It's called the Brand Z uh, Top 50 Brand Award. And um, attempt to show you how we've tried to simplify the mysterious thing called brand and its subcomponents and try to, um, uh, try to bring out the truth of how companies have created values for themselves, their stakeholders, uh, over a different period of time. So this is a presentation taken from a very recent press release and an um, event that we did. It's called Brand Z Top 50 Brand Award, uh, where we had called upon different, we had studied the brand uh, value, uh, the value that the brand creates, and uh, we tried to simplify some lessons that we can learn from uh, this brand. All right. Uh, a few slides on agenda, what brands the top 50 most, Indian, most valuable Indian brands are about, and then I will also talk about some of the learnings that we got from there. 
Uh, Brandsy is the largest brand building uh, uh, platform in the world. It was established in 1998. The global release for this happened in uh, the New York Stock Exchange. And uh, Martin Sorrell, who's the head of the WPP group, the group that our company belongs to. Uh, so our company belongs to a group called Cantor Group, and Cantor is a part of WPP Group. And that launched the survey with the idea of telling brands how they can manage their brands better. Uh, it's, it's a large survey, consumer survey based. It covers several categories. It's present in several markets and countries. And in India, we have started running a specialized session uh, for India with about 100,000 consumers, consumers that we survey across for, for about 3,000 different brands that spread across 80 different categories. Possibly it's the largest big data, not in the technical sense of the big data, but definitely it's the largest database today on the brand. And why are we doing this? We are doing this because we find that there's a strong relationship between the stock market capitalizations and the brands that do well. Now, what does this graph tell us is if we take, this is the global data, and I will tell you about the India data in the next slide. But in the global database, uh, what we see is the brands that have come up as the top 50 brandsy ranked brands, they tend to generate better returns for the shareholders in the stock market as compared to the standard and poor 500 list, right? So how do we arrive at it? We have two-step process. We take the financial value of the brand, and then we look at the brand contribution. We multiply the two and very simplistically arrive at the brand value. That's just a two-step process. Financial valuation of the brand comes from Bloomberg data, PNL data, from other um, finance analyst data, and the brand contribution comes from our primary survey about the brand. The two of them together gives us the brand value. And now, Brand Z top 50 most valuable Indian brands. Here are they. They are complex. You will not get all of them, but you will be able to recognize some of the logo. We will talk about a few of them that made the difference in the next few slides. Before that, again, why are we talking about Brand Z? Because if you see, the combined value of the brand in 2014 stood at $69.6 .6 billion. And in 2017, it, it stands at $109.3 million, $3 billion. That's a 57% growth over the three years, which is for India, which is higher than a similar exercise that we did in China, and is still higher than the global average, which tells us what? Which tells us that our country is, the brands in our country are doing far better than many other brands the, or the same brands in many other countries. And that's the opportunity we heard the professor talk in the morning, the opportunity that awaits all of you, right? Then, we looked at the top 50 brands and we looked at something called the brand power, which comes out of the brand contribution calculation, okay? What does that tell us? That tell us that the brands that have high brand contribution, remember there were two, two parameters that went into brand value, the financial value and the brand contribution. Now we are talking about the brand contribution. And the ones which have higher brand contribution tend to return higher value growth for their customers. That's about 211 on an index scale as compared to 100, which is amongst the brands that are not doing as well on the brand power. If you look at what exactly makes the brands become a high power brand, one factor that comes up is being meaningfully differentiated, right? Brands that are meaningfully differentiated tends to generate higher brand power, which means they generate higher brand contribution, which means they generate higher financial value, and therefore, they end up having a higher brand value for all the stakeholders, right? And is this about global brands? If you look at the list, it is not. Of the top 50, 35 of them in 2014 were Indian brands, whereas only 15 of them were global brands 
or Indian-owned global brands. Right? In, in 2017, we have that list go up from 38, 35 to 38. Right. So, therefore, people will love your brand irrespective of its origin. Right? And we have this big myth in our minds that if it's a global brand, multinational brand, people will love it. That's not what this result says. It says if the brand delivers value, people will go for it. They will buy it. People don't really bother to check who's the owner of that brand. What they bother to check is what does that brand mean to me? Right. And look at this. We have the brands that rise fastest in the brand contribution. If you look at it, most of them are financial brands of Indian origin, right? We have very few multinational brands over here, right? If you look at this part, you'll see a brand called Maggie. It's a multinational brand, I agree. But this brand went through a lot of controversies. Do you recollect? Right. But you see the brand power. People love this brand so much that when the controversies were over, it has bounced back and it has risen faster than many other brands, right? Both from a financial term and other, other perspectives. Why does that happen? Because it's a great brand, right? Okay, so holding out your place in the top 50 is also not easy. We haven't seen, um, uh, we, have, we have seen rather, it's a, quite a struggle to stay in the top 50 brand brackets. It's also contested constantly by many brands, right? There were 18% of those brands that declined in their ranking. Some 48% held their position. Um, some 106% uh, uh, improvement in the brand value. Um, and net-net, if you look at the top uh, 50, there's some 57% uh, that's kind of, you know, uh, been able to either increase or hold out their position, right? New entrants keep coming in all the time. And if you see in the recent times, the number of new entrants have only increased, right? We have new entrants. Someone was talking about Geo in the morning, right? Somebody was talking about Geo. So here's Geo. When we looked at the Geo data, it's just launched. It's not even out in the market, but yet it made it as the 11th, it got the 11th rank of the top 50 in the top 50. Now that's amazing because that tells me that in the telecommunication and technology enabled area, if you have an Indian offering, people are okay with it. People are perfectly fine with it, right? Okay. So what makes brands more most valuable? And we, we came across, we tried to simplify this complex phenomenon further. In the first few slides, I talked about simplifying brand value by two components, the financial value and the brand contribution. In this slide, you will see that we have tried to simplify it even further by saying that brand contribution or meaningfully different brands, when you talk about it, has five vital signs. Okay. No more than five. First and foremost, they have a purpose. Second, they have to be out there innovating all the time. They need to talk about their innovations in compelling language of communication. And they need to deliver to the consumers the experience that they promise and create love for their brand. Right. If they do this, they, they are likely to uh, be a meaningfully differentiated brand and have a higher brand contribution. We call the summation of all these as brand vitality quotient, right? These are the five that the brand that do well, that do better, manage to outperform on. And what are we doing by saying all this? We are trying to simplify the complex world of brand valuation, brand contribution, right? There are some more data here. And I'm going to skip through this and I'm going to come back to the fact that if you see your most loved brands, all kinds of brands figure there. It's an open list. You have brands like Uber coming there, 
a very recent entrant. Does that, who, how many of us have used an Uber or a Ola? All, right? Almost all. And, just, and to think of it, it's a brand that just got launched a few, few years back, just a couple of years back. And all of us almost have some kind of experience with that brand. Right? And I'm not going to ask you how many of us have a Facebook account, right? So, but those who don't have a Facebook account can raise their hands. Don't have a Facebook account? Oh, wonderful. That's unusual, but yeah. And brand building pace, the brands that invest in building purpose, creating innovation, communicating the innovation in a manner that consumers feel they are innovative, right? And deliver that experience true to their promise to create brand love is, is a good, good thing to do. One of the brands, Again, Mouth is to Suzuki. I do not know whether to call it an Indian brand or it's a multinational brand. There's a Suzuki involved. But it's an Indian-made multinational brand or a multinational-made Indian brand. You can, you can look at it either ways. Consumers really don't bother. They have been able to generate 195% increase in their uh, brand valuation or the brand value in the last three years. 200% growth, nearly 200% growth for them. You can see the Maggie story. When the controversies died out, it's kind of bounced back very fast, right? Because the brand enables the proposition to be accepted by the consumers and be bought by them. Right, so, uh, and here's your most famous brand that people are talking about, Patanjali. No, no conversation on brand can be complete without the mention of this brand. Look at the way it has become popular, right? So a few years back, people re refused to acknowledge its existence as a brand and a serious competitor. Today, the debate is whether it is the second largest FMCG company or the third, right? The first being Unilever, right? So it's, it's, it's being talked about at that level. It did things differently, didn't it? Right? Didn't that company do things quite differently? Right? So if you do something different, consumers are going to like you, consumers are going to take you, accept you, acknowledge you. Which is why a healthy brand becomes a wealthy brand and that opportunity to create that wealth is available to not just established players but anybody who has that proposition to offer to the consumer and that's where all of us can contribute to. It's not necessary for us to wait and join great brands, but it can also be very much possible for us to take our ideas to the market in a company, outside a company, and create brands of our own as well. Now with that, I will, I will try to come back to the key question that we were discussing. So what makes all this happen? What kind of skills we need to do, uh, or we need to focus on building to do that? Clearly, the skill of bringing stability in our thinking, a stability and a consistency in what we do, what we say, what we talk about becomes important, right? An ability to uh, bring certainty in our actions and our promises. We cannot be talking in our day-to-day -day lives in uncertainty. And I know there are people who would at times plan a trip they would just say, pick up the bag and let's go for the trip. At the same time, the others would say, no, we can't go for a trip like that. We have to first plan this. Then we have to plan this. What do we do after landing at the station? How many people will go this way? How many people will go that way? Where will the tickets come in from? So some people want certainty all through. And the others say, well, we are going to do all of that. Then when are we going to enjoy, right? So <laughs> there are going to be all kinds of issues. But I think we will have to practice to be more certain to say something that we're going to make it happen and then we're going to work towards making that happen, right? We will need to have the skills to simplify. So why did I show you the brand Z top 50 brand is, is basically to tell you that even at that level 
what we are essentially doing here is simplifying this mystique of brand value into simple five elements and those five elements is what we have brought forth and showed, showed, showed you. The five elements being the brand purpose, the innovation that the brand brings to the table, the communication about that innovation, the experience it delivers and the love it creates amongst consumers, right? Now it's five simple things that they have to do. And, and clients like that because they know now what exactly they got to chase in order to create healthy brands which will therefore create wealth for the stakeholders. Ambiguity in our conversations and our recommendations in our day-to-day um, -day conversations need to uh, therefore be addressed to bringing in specificity in what we do. We got to be more specific in what we do. And to do all of that, we need to borrow learnings, not just from our marketing textbooks, but we need to dabble into a wider range of thinking that can help us sharpen our thinking frames, our thinking reference points, and these may come from not just marketing textbooks, but they will also come from the science, uh, field of politics, anthropology, sociology, psychology, uh, yes, of course, statistics, and definitely marketing, but also all of these, including technology, right? So it's important to stay alert, stay informed. Stay informed about these fields, not get into the technical nitty gritties, but to glean for yourself those things that can be inspiring and adaptable for creating consumer value. Uh, with that, I would leave the, uh, I would let this any Q&A come in and I can take that Q&A. I hope you find that, found that interesting. So you were talking about brand contribution. So uh, how do you, what do you actually measure in brand contribution? Uh, right. Like what are the actual components that you find in the survey for the brand contribution? The next, how do you uh, quantify the components such as love and experience? And uh, the third question was, uh, sir, uh, where, uh, how, how can a company such as Ola uh, or Uber create uh, innovation in uh, further years of uh, their uh, okay. company? So I will ask you to repeat those questions as we go along. Sure. But first question I think you had asked about is uh, how do you measure brand contribution? And uh, the answer to that is uh, the brand contribution in this survey is measured by a character called uh, a terminology that we are using here called the brand power. Now brand power is a, uh, is a power that we compute uh, out of three variables. Uh, we call it how meaningful the brand is how different the brand is and how salient the brand is. So there are these three measures that go into uh, constituting uh, brand, con uh, brand power. Now for these three measures, again if you see, for being meaningful, the, it should be a brand that meets my need and it's a brand that I would love. These two constructs are important in driving meaningfulness. For being different, uh, the brand has to be seen as a trendsetter. Uh, it has to be seen as uh, offering something superiorly different from competition uh, and it, it, is, it is a brand that has a lot of buzz and vitality around it. So that's the elements that go into creating differentiation. And when you talk about salience, we talk about two kinds of salience. One is the quality of salience, which is, is it the first brand that comes to your mind when you talk about that category. Uh, there's also another kind of salience. The other kind of salience is uh, when you have a particular need, is this the first brand that you will go to to meet that need? So if you're hungry, is it McDonald's that you're going to go after? Is it KFC you're going to go after? Or is it Maggie? You know? So you would, you would, for the need, what is a brand that comes to your mind? So these are the two constructs that go into the salience. The three of them, uh, the meaningfulness, the uh, the differentiation capability and the salience capability together create the brand power. That's the first question. You had a second question. Uh, on? So how do you quantify uh, components such as love and experience? Right. So in the survey, it is very simple. Okay. We have a question uh, that we ask in terms of how much you love the brand on a, on a simple rating scale. And, and that, that should be good enough for us to quantify uh, the quantum of love that consumer have for the brand, 
is we're not talking about love outside the love of the brand here, right? So that's that's the simple. It's a simple question that we ask. And uh, the third was how uh, how do you find Ola and uh, Uber uh, growing up with their innovation skills? Like where uh, where and all can they uh, come up with their innovative skills? Right, and this is the brand that we were talking about. Even when uh, I think uh, I was being uh, you know brought from the airport, we <laughs> were talking about this. Uh, both Ola and Uber are uh, fantastic cases of uh, innovation. Okay, and the thing that I keep telling up, uh, to various clients as well, for instance. Um, the driving school, the uh, school where you learn driving, right? Um, uh, Ola Uber is, uh, you can really compare the two, and I will tell you what the comparison between the two is. Um, and, and we'll also talk a little bit on this issue to give you a context on the uh, fairness cream market. So the fairness cream market is roughly about 400 crores, uh, 400, 450 crores, maybe 500 crores, and that's because uh, Fair and Handsome has come in and take grown the market by uh, another 200, 250 crores or so. Um, before that, it was only the fairness cream for the women segment. Um, but even in this 400, 500 crore market, you have compelling brands, right? You have uh, several brands that you can think of as, as brands that you would want to go to. When you talk about the transportation market, and I will come, I will just tell you in a minute why I'm talking about the crores over here. When you look at the transportation market, let's take a case like auto rickshaw. Um, and I will take a reference of Bangalore. Now, uh, Bangalore has a population of 74 lakhs and it has got about 160 or 170,000 auto rickshaws in the city, of which about roughly 100,000 auto rickshaws are piling on a day. Even if you assume that each auto rickshaw is making about 500 rupees a day, that's about um, 5 crores, right? Yeah, that's about five crores. Am I correct? Yeah, five crores uh, in a day. Now multiply that with 365. Okay, how much it is, right? It's easily about um, 1,300 crores, right? 1,300 crores in a city. Okay, and the face cream market is 400, 500 crores. It has wonderful brands in it. This is a 1,300 crore in one city. Take India's top eight cities. Uh, this, you can multiply it by another eight. A 10,000 crore business industry doesn't have a single brand that people can look up to and recollect or recall. Well, as when you talk about face cream market, much smaller, but it has got compelling brands. People love brands here. But in 10,000 crore industry, there's no brand. Now, what does this tell you? This tells you that the, that industry is ready for a branded proposition. The big challenge is how do I create a branded proposition and that's where Ola and Uber have come in and they've created something called the asset light companies. They don't have assets. They don't own a single piece yet consumers love this company. Okay. Yesterday while coming from home to the airport I took an Uber and this guy was, uh, uh, he did exceptionally good driving because I called him at a time which was just about I would reach the airport just 40, 45 minutes before the gates close, and this guy did everything to drive fast, and at the end of the day, he said, sir, five-star rating is you know, So, I mean, look at the change in the driver, driver's attitude, right? So, this wasn't the case when Ola Uber were not there, right? So, there is a great amount of innovation that benefits consumer. I'm more confident of walking into an Uber taxi th in, in the, in the in, with, a, with this th thought that that driver is going to care for me which was not the case when there were no Ola's Uber. The first thing was, how do I catch hold of the driver? How do I bargain with him? How do I negotiate with him? How do I make sure that he doesn't cheat me? How do I make sure that I don't get cheated? These were the phenomenal you know, mindsets or sentiments are going on in the mind before an Ola or Uber. Right? So those are some examples of wonderful innovations that they have done that have touched consumers' life. Morning, sir. Uh, first of all, it's a pleasure to have you on Dice here, sir. Uh, second, my question, uh, that the question that he asked, like how do you quantify the feelings, the feeling of love or the experience that a consumer have? So uh, do you think marketing research is still facing a challenge in terms of measuring the feelings at incognitive levels which drive a consumer more to buy the products? Uh, the challenge will be more about the measuring the effect effective sentiments rather than the 
cognitive sentiments. Cognitive sentiments are easier to measure. Okay. Um, uh, anyway, market research is largely focused on the connotative element. So, any, any behavior will have your affective components, which is what your heart says, the cognitive component, which is your uh, rational thinking, and uh, the two together will create a behavior in you. So, the behavior is what we call as the connotative component. So, connotative component is what we measure and we decipher through that the effective and the uh, cognitive uh, uh, components. Uh, measuring love, uh, measuring um, uh, you know the uh, delight levels, uh, there are a variety of scales available to do that and that is a very well researched area. Um, for instance, you asked about experience, how do we measure experience? So, beginning from a simple Likert scale to something that is much more differentiated like the NPS scale, the net promoter score, um, uh, to various other different types of scales do exist, uh, which can be leveraged to measure experience. To measure love, uh, again, we do that by using a rating scale. Thank you, sir, for enlightening us with your words of wisdom for sharing the knowledge about marketing. Now we know how to create value in people's life. One and all present here have known the answers to the questions present in the VUCA world. Thank you, sir, for, pro for your productive speech about brand value and brand building.